Well, welcome and thanks to everyone joining us today. My name is Michelle Cloutier and as the Vice President for Enrollment Management at Bryant University, it is my great pleasure to serve as the host and moderator for today's panel. On behalf of the faculty and staff here at Bryant, please know that the entire community continues to work hard to keep our community healthy and so that we can benefit from a full fall semester on campus. We're all in this together and proud of completing our first month with students back at Bryant and enjoying the classroom and residential life experience. As for today's panel, uh, our goal today is to work with families and explore how we can keep Bryant's successful reopening going for a rewarding fall semester for our students. The leadership team has comprehensive plans in place and we are listening closely and learning all of the time as we see what is happening, happening on other campuses and we refine our plans accordingly. Before we begin today's discussion, I wanna provide an overview of this afternoon's program. Uh, Dr. Ross Gattel, the university president, will speak first and he'll be sharing a behind the scenes look at some of the data he uses to guide Bryant's successful testing strategy. From there, our vice president for student affairs and dean of students, Dr. Inga Lees Amir, and Provost Glenn Salmacy will share their observations on what we are doing really well with, where there are areas where we need to stay vigilant or need to improve, and how they're approaching spring planning in their respective areas. Before we wrap up, we'll have about 15 minutes at the end to address a few questions that have been emailed through our reopening at bryant.edu mailbox and may be of common interest to many of you. So without further ado, ado, it is my sincere pleasure to introduce to you our president, Dr. Ross Gattel. Thank you, uh, Michelle, and thank you uh, to the parents joining us uh, today, this afternoon. I had a chance to meet some of you uh, when you moved in your sons and daughters uh, about six weeks ago, uh, uh, five, six weeks ago. Uh, and uh, look forward to the follow-up discussion here and giving you an update about uh, the semester. I've been president now for almost three months. Uh, I started July 1st, uh, and it's been a very busy time here, as you could well imagine, uh, opening up the campus uh, during a uh, global pandemic. And as you know, we're focusing on the safety and health of your students while still uh, providing a very high quality education uh, and student life experience uh, at Bryant University. I have to tell you, I congratulate you. Um, your sons and daughters have done a great job uh, over the past uh, month uh, on campus. Uh, we are all proud of what is happening on our campus. And uh, that is really not the same as uh, what's happening in a lot of other institutions, both uh, in our state uh, and in our region uh, and nationally. And that's really um, uh, uh, reflects very positively uh, on the whole community, but in particular, your sons and daughters who have been uh, really adhering to uh, some of the things we've asked them to do uh, during these challenging times. Uh, and that includes, as we'll talk about uh, in some more detail, uh, masking appropriately uh, and uh, keeping distance and not gathering in large groups. And, now we've uh, really asked them to stay on campus as much as possible. Uh, and it's really uh, to learn from the experience of other institutions and to really draw on our own data. And we have extensive data from our testing. Uh, we are uh, invested in very aggressive testing of the semester. Uh, those of you who did come to campus to drop off your sons and daughters uh, were exposed to that early on, the first thing we do we did when people came to campus, uh, when our students came to campus was uh, uh, do a COVID-19 test. And we've been doing that on a regular basis. And uh, we track, we track the daily data results and uh, I analyze them along with my colleagues that uh, are participating here and others to really get an assessment for the, uh, the picture of the university uh, right now with regards to uh, the coronavirus and to uh, indicate what policies will be uh, most important for us as we move forward to try to ensure that we stay an active and an open campus this semester. So as Michelle indicated, I'm gonna give you a little window of uh, what we do here to, uh, to manage this process and at the same time, give you an update on our situation here on campus with regards to uh, COVID-19. Uh, 
I tend to be an early riser anyway, especially uh, in a New England fall. It's been a beautiful fall here. If you're, if you, if you're from the region, you know that. And uh, getting up early uh, is something that I've always do, but now I get up early and Inga and her team uh, share data with me uh, at five or six o'clock in the morning. And the data is really the last, the, the prior day's uh, testing results uh, as they come in. And then we follow up on that data as appropriate. And we've had times where we had to more actively follow up on that data uh, with regards to informing uh, people if they have uh, contracted the COVID uh, virus and, and uh, whether or not we have to quarantine people. But uh, we've done very well with regards to containing the virus. And so let me give you a little snapshot of our latest data and what I look at with my team every morning and how we manage uh, this process. Uh, so if you see the data there, uh, uh, you know, we're actually doing what our, we're asking our students to do is to really get familiar with data and use it actively in decision making. So we're doing that here. So this is our dashboard uh, that uh, reflects our, our testing data. And as you can see, uh, in our five plus weeks of testing, uh, uh, full population testing every week, we do about a thousand tests a day during the, the five day uh, weekday period. And so over the course of this five plus week period, we've done over 28,000 tests. And you could see that uh, over the full, over the full uh, period of time, uh, out of 28,000 tests, uh, only 28 positive tests. And so that's a, a 0.1, 0 0.1% positivity test rate. And you could, uh, you know, uh, compare that to other institutions. Uh, uh, which are at the four or five percent uh, uh, levels. Uh, uh, we are much lower than that at uh, basically one out of every uh, thousand tests and at a very low rate. And that's cumulative. Uh, there are much lower number of uh, current cases as I'll share with you in a little bit. We also uh, know that it's important to not only have the, the uh, cumulative data, but also what's the most current data? What's the most uh, uh, recent experience over what we look at the seven day moving average, or for us is a five day period, a weekday testing period of about 5,000. So you can see over the last seven day period, we've done you know just under 5,000 tests at 4,773. And over that full period with close to 5,000 tests, we've only had two uh, positive uh, uh, tests back. And that uh, shows that our, uh, our test positivity test rate is not only very low at that 0.1%, but it's also stable and even slightly declining. So now our positivity test rate is at 0.04%, which, uh, which is very, very low. You won't have uh, many population tests anywhere in this country or in this world where, where it's that low. So you know, we're not going to rest on our laurels and we're going to talk about that, but, but uh, uh, we feel very uh, uh, good on where we're at right now. And again, uh, it's because of the practices that students, faculty and staff have put it uh, uh, at the top of their list uh, this semester. And so you can see on the right hand side that bar graph is uh, uh, shows the daily test performs and uh, we get the highest number of tests taken on Monday after the weekend, and then you can see about that thousand tests a day average uh, over the period. Now, if we move to the uh, tab positive graphs, uh, this gives you more granular information, and it gives us more granular information to uh, to act upon. As I mentioned before, um, we have the 28 uh, positive uh, uh, cases of uh, COVID on campus over the five plus week period, but there's only 13 current cases now uh, for our full population uh, across the university. And then you see to, uh, to your left of that case status uh, bar graph, you see the uh, kind of busy uh, blue bar uh, graph, which actually has uh, who uh, among our population have the highest incidence of uh, of COVID positive rates. And you can see it's of resident students and there's somewhat of a concentration among student athletes. Uh, so we've taken the test, uh, the, the appropriate uh, uh, reaction on this and 
we require extra testing, more than the once a week that we require everybody on campus for, for student athletes are testing uh, two or three times a week because they are a more uh, vulnerable population and that strategy has worked. We're seeing positive results from that. Now, if you go to, if we go down a little bit on the, uh, in the spreadsheet, you could see that exposure site uh, incidents and you could see a very, very high percentage of our uh, exposures, the uh, positive uh, tests are uh, due to off-campus contacts. And that is why uh, we were wanting to limit off-campus activities for students. And that is why Inger and Glenn and their teens are, are having more and more activities for students to do on campus. And we took the steps this past Friday to further restrict off-campus activity because we know that's where we're most vulnerable and particularly when we hear about the outbreaks of Providence College and other nearby uh, institutions. Uh, and we want to restrict the movement of our students to those campuses and students from those campuses to our campus uh, during this period of time. So I go through this exercise with you to, to give you an update, but also to say that we're using this data to manage uh, the campus and public uh, health and safety during this time period. Uh, we're benefiting greatly uh, from our testing, our aggressive testing, and that's with the Broad Institute of Harvard at MIT, which is arguably the, uh, the most respected uh, uh, testing available in the nation. Uh, uh, their accuracy rate is very high and their turnaround is very fast, uh, under 24 hours, and it's really important that if you get somebody test positive, that you are testing them, but it's even more important that you get those results in a timely basis so you can act on that and limit the exposure uh, from that individual to others who, who might contract that virus unless you limited that activity of that individual with the virus. So, uh, you know, again, uh, I wanna thank you uh, and your sons and daughters for their cooperation. And I wanted to share with you here the types of things uh, we're doing. Uh, uh, our provost likes to tell us how many days uh, we have left. Uh, I really focus on uh, how far into the semester we're in. And we have a uh, you know, full residency campus, 90% of residency is last year. Uh, we're as into the semester as any uh, institution in the nation virtually, uh, maybe as one or two that have uh, more, uh, moved up their calendar as much as we did. And, uh, you know, uh, we will end the semester uh, and that includes finals uh, before Thanksgiving. So we've made a lot of progress to date, uh, but we have to really rely on you, your sons and daughters to keep campus uh, uh, safe and healthy. And so we're gonna go into some more details about uh, how we wanna work with you on this and what we are doing right now to ensure that we finish the semester on campus. So Michelle, I hope that covered it, gave a little bit behind the scenes and an update uh, on this process. Thank you, President Cattell. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, um, Dr. Ingalisa Mir, who is our Vice President for Student Affairs and Dean of Students, who's going to talk with you about the important things with respect to residence life uh, and all that falls under her umbrella in Student Affairs. Inga. Thank you, Michelle. Hey, Bulldog families, it's awesome to see you, and uh, I look forward to seeing all of you in the spring. Uh, I have this picture in the back of spring uh, on the Bryant campus because it inspires me that we're going to get there, and I'm feeling very confident about it. But I'm primarily feeling very confident about it because your students are doing an extraordinary job in helping us lead in this effort. And I just don't think that that statement can be said enough. Right now is a critical time in the history of the world and in the country and in Rhode Island. And our Bryant students are stepping up to the challenge and taking lots of the great values that you taught them and lots of the wonderful things they've learned in the classroom and outside of the classroom and are applying it to how they're choosing to live their lives on campus. And uh, for me, it's very impressive and inspiring 
to uh, to watch this every day. And of course, it's amazing to have students back on campus. A couple of reminders to help us all stay healthy and safe. Flu shots, flu shots, flu shots. Please encourage your students to get flu shots. We have two uh, flu shot clinics scheduled for right now, uh, October 20th from 10 to 2 and um, October 28th from 12 to 4. Uh, we will be scheduling more. That's when um, our provider uh, is able to get us our vaccines. We will be doing those shots right where your students do their COVID tests. So it'll be really easy to get a test and I mean to get a shot and um, uh, to uh, really help take care of themselves. Why do people need flu shots this year? Well, many of the symptoms obviously that present for COVID also present as the flu. So um, in order for us to be able to keep the two diagnoses as separate as possible, uh, it would be very helpful if you could encourage your students to get uh, flu shots. They can also get them off campus uh, when they go to run errands. Sometimes uh, CVS and Walgreens are also providing um, flu shots. I would also encourage all of you, if you can, to uh, get a flu shot. It's going to be really critical this year for all of us to do that. We're also having uh, flu shot clinics for staff and faculty, just in case you were wondering. So we're, as we do with all of our COVID planning, really trying to layer our decision making so that we encourage flu shots across the campus not just asking students to take the burden of all of this, but that the whole campus steps up and um, works to be healthy and to get us through all of this. Uh, as many of you are senior parents, I just wanted to remind you that we have a robust offering of um, virtual career fairs. We're doing more career fairs than we did before because we know it can be a little intimidating to uh, meet an employer virtually, but our students are really stepping up. At one of the fairs last week, we had 1,400 students participate, and that was really exciting. And we have had close to 300 just last week alone, face-to-face uh, -face student uh, to employer uh, visits. We have a um, nonprofit and health virtual fair coming up this week. So I just wanted you to know that we still care deeply about employment after graduating from Bryant and the Amica Center in Student Affairs is working very hard to keep that promise alive. So I just wanted to reiterate that. And then we're running a full campus here. So uh, just wanna remind you that we have 150 student organizations, the gym is open, there are exercise classes, there are student activities, the Amica Center is open health services is open and so is counseling and the Fisher Center. And uh, we started back on all our religious services. Um, uh, tonight, our rabbi will be leading in our Yom Kippur services. So we are a fully engaged and I just want you as much as you can to encourage your students to put their mask on and go outside of their room and get involved in all the wonderful things going on on campus. And then we will be doing uh, family and friends weekend virtually this year. It'll be October 23rd to the 25th, and you can look for more uh, information about that to come. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Vice President Amir. Now I'd like to introduce to you our next speaker, um, our provost, um, Glenn Salmacy. He is gonna talk about um, how he has been leading the charge for all things um, academic, um, as we this semester is um, successfully unfolding. Thanks, Michelle. And uh, I just want to reaffirm what President Gattel and Vice President Amir were noting, and Michelle did as well at the outset, is that we're really appreciative of the leadership of your daughters and sons uh, who are really leading the way. This has been a true Bryant collaborative effort of faculty, staff, students, and the community coming together to try to make sure we can get through this semester. So without your support, without your daughters and sons leading the way, particularly the seniors. I mean, this is important, you know, this is for you today. And, and, and you as parents have been with us now right through it all and, and saw last year and they were coming back ready to go and ready to go in the right way. And we appreciate that. 
and right now we're on target and tracking. But uh, the semester is going well. I mean, the students seem content. As most of you know, we have Saturday classes, five Saturday classes this semester, Labor Day and Columbus Day. And that was all an attempt, as we said up front, was to make sure the public safety, that the safety of all of us was paramount. And by doing so, we started early, as you know, the 25th of August, two weeks before Labor Day. I mean, it was a big, big thing. Then we're having classes on Labor Day. We're having classes on Columbus Day and five Saturdays. But when President Cattell and I and, and Vice President Mayor and Vice President Cludi are walking around talk to your sons and daughters, the reaction is one that you would think is quite impressive, and it is. They always say, we just want to do this. We want to be here. It's better than we thought, Glenn. We, it's better than we thought, President Cattell. And that's a good feeling to hear um, from them because, the, you know, as you know, in any leadership uh, philosophy, the seniors are setting the stage no matter what. And the juniors watch them and the sophomores watch them and the freshmen of first years watch them as well. So to watch them uh, rise to the occasion has been particularly heartwarming for all of us. And I think uh, I, I thank you. Um, on the Saturdays, I, I can tell you I'm probably not that most popular guy on campus or person on campus when I walk around and ask them how they're doing today. But they are very, very good about it, like I say, and know that the bottom line is we will be done with all classes. 16th of November, which is 48, little over 48 days from today. And we will be done by the 24th of November with all finals. So when your daughters and sons return home, or wherever you're going to be for the holidays, they will not have finals to do. They will not have any sort of uh, work to do, any outstanding projects. Grades will be submitted and be ready to go. So uh, they're appreciative of that, I think, and you will be as well. As part of that, though, we thought there's a win December and January. We normally just have our winter session in January, and I just want to reiterate the calendar again is December, we'll have a full set of classes available in January. So we'll have winter session one, and winter session two, and that's on our, in banner right now, the courses, and also up uh, on our website of what, what is being offered and what the time frames are. The important thing for us is that it's both College of Business classes as well as College of Arts and Sciences. When we were first doing the calendar, put it together, Ross said to me, hey, Glenn, I know it's great you have the January session, but gosh, I have had two daughters, and Inges had two that graduated. You know, I have a few that are coming through, and I have one that graduated. When they're home like that, they're going to be home for all December. Why don't we try to provide an offering for the students during December as well? So they're not just home if they can't get employment because of the virus, if they can't have other opportunities because of the virus. What a great chance to do all remote learning and a compressed schedule uh, to get uh, satisfy some coursework, uh, whether it could be something in, within the sequencing of their major in the College of Business. It could be something like Accounting 203 or Accounting 204, or uh, Management 201, or, or, or it could be something they've never taken, Introduction to Film Studies is being offered. I mean, these are type of things that they might want to take, they haven't taken. And one of the items that uh, I want you to know during both sessions, that we are redu offering reduced tuition. That's something we said we we're going to do, and we wanted to do that for all the students. So it'll be reduced tuition for both sessions, Winter Session 1 and Winter Session 2, and we're happy to do that as part of the uh, thanks, if you will for all that's been taking place and going on. And I thank President Cattell for supporting that. The uh, next item that we're really working, as you can imagine, right around the corner of spring. What are we doing, Glenn? And that's posted now. You know, we have to go ahead and, and iron out the spring calendar. And that's an interesting one because we'll really be starting remotely on February 1st. So from February 1st to the 5th, we'll be remote. And the move-in is three days, 6, 7, and 8 February with classes in person beginning on the 9th of February. So the intention behind this is that we'd have the IDEA program that last week of January. We begin classes, but we really don't know where this virus is gonna go. We have to be realistic. Right now, it seems like it's getting under control and the next day it's not. Uh, you see it spiking in different places, different parts of the country in France specifically and in Spain uh, over the last week had a tremendous spike. So we're watching everywhere as well as within our own country to see where this ever wandering COVID-19 will be come February 1st or any other time. So what we want to be able to do is provide potential elasticity of that remote. Uh, if things did go south, where in January 25th, uh, there's spikes all over New England, we might have to go remote. We can do so at that point. But we didn't, the worst thing we want to do is to bring you back and then have to have everybody go back home. Um, 
but we have all sorts of contingency plans in place when something like that might happen. So you know, Vice President Amir, President Gattel, and myself meet bi-weekly to go through scenario planning of what's happening, what could happen, what do we do for each scenario if someone gets it, if this happens, and basically tabletop exercise for what we should or can do during different scenarios. And that's been going well so far, obviously, as, as we've continued through this semester. One thing that's on everybody's mind, right now the conclusion of the spring semester is commencement in May for your uh, daughters and sons. There's nothing we want more than to have a full commencement week for your sons and daughters and have commencement on that Saturday the 20th. And that is still scheduled right now. But I have to manage expectations. We have to be able to watch what the virus is doing. As you know, we didn't know when it would be last March. And every time we adjust, I think the country is getting used to a new normal. And, and we're getting settled with that. But right now, um, we're hoping, and we have it on the schedule, and the plan is to have a wonderful commencement week and a commencement exercise for your daughters and sons, and for all of you, and to say thank you to you. It's a great time for parents as well, as you know. But we want to uh, be realistic about we're not sure, and if anyone's able to tell you where the virus will be next uh, March, April, May, I would uh, like to meet them, because I think anyone saying that is probably not necessarily uh, up to speed because it really is an ever wandering virus and one that we're not really sure where it'll be. So, but we are looking forward to it. We thank you so much. It's been great uh, knowing all of you over the past three years and seeing your daughters and sons mature and grow into the fine young leaders that they are here at this point and we need them. And we need your support to continue to finish this semester strong and to go into the spring. Academically, they're doing extremely well and they've adjusted considerably to this high flex model, which is not the ideal way for your sons and daughters to learn. But they've adjusted and they're learning and taking this new pedagogical approach in stride because they want to be here and we love to have them here. So Michelle, hopefully that answers a general overview of what we're looking at in the fall and a little, little lens into the spring. Great, right. thank you, Provost Lamacy. We're now gonna um, switch to do some of the question and answers um, part of the webinar. Um, President Gattel, this first question is for you. Uh, what circumstances would cause Bryant to suspend residential living and classes on site this fall? And how many positive cases does there have to be for students to be sent home? Yeah, Michelle, that's a, uh, a good question and a question that's uh, uh, on a lot of people's minds uh, uh, during this period. Uh, if we begin to see any uh, signs of an outbreak on campus, uh, and you know we would be able to pick that up uh, very fast, as I shared with you the data, because we do so much testing on a daily basis. Uh, uh, but if we were uh, seeing some signs of a kick up, which would be a, a significant increase in the number of uh, positive uh, COVID tests and the positivity rate, uh, we would work very closely with the Rhode Island Department of Health on what steps to take next. Uh, we have been working with them closely since last spring, and that continued over the summer where they reviewed our plans, and we continue to, to meet with them on a very regular basis. And then when there is uh, any signs of an outbreak, uh, the institution, in this case, Brian, would work closely with the Rhode Island Department of Health on what steps to take. Uh, the best practice that is emerging uh, and endorsed by Dr. Fauci and others is that in the event of an outbreak, colleges uh, will keep students on campus uh, with widespread quarantine and the restricting, or in our case, the further restricting of activities. Uh, there are schools that have uh, taken this approach successfully. Uh, for example, Notre Dame, uh, very early on in their semester, uh, had an outbreak, significant outbreak. They transitioned to remote classes uh, for two weeks, and now they've been able to resume uh, uh, in-class uh, instruction. And this is the first model uh, that we will look at because it's the one that has emerged nationally and it seems to be working at other institutions. Uh, but of course, we would do that in consultation with the Rhode Island Department of Health, and we would, uh, you know, give a very high priority to keeping uh, parents informed. And as you know, we're communicating on a very regular basis uh, with our whole campus, including our students. Uh, to have the flexibility uh, as to the response to any outbreak, uh, that is why we invested so heavily in our academic technology. 
and the ability to have a, uh, a high flex instructional uh, methodology. So we could really uh, switch uh, fairly rapidly uh, from in-class instruction to remote uh, instruction because of this investment in technology, academic technology. And your sons and daughters, our students, uh, are uh, very uh, familiar with it, have been exposed to this uh, delivery methodology. So we could uh, uh, switch uh, as needed, uh, and we would switch uh, if we had a significant outbreak. Uh, we're well below any number that would cause us to switch to remote instruction, as I shared with you before. Uh, the colleges that have switched uh, to remote instruction are well into the multiple hundreds uh, as far as uh, COVID cases, uh, and there's even uh, colleges, institutions, and in other parts of the country which are in the thousands of cases, and some of those are are staying open. It depends upon the size of the, that institution and uh, what's occurring right now at this point in time. Aside from the switching to remote uh, for a couple of weeks and keeping students on campus, another option uh, that we could consider and might consider is a move to de-densify the campus by sending some students home, but not everyone. Uh, you know, in, uh, in closing, uh, in response to your question, Michelle, uh, unfortunately, there's no simple uh, answer to the question. It would really depend upon uh, uh, how significant the outbreak was, you know, uh, uh, how far the contagion appeared to be uh, on a day-to-day uh, -day basis. And then we would follow best practices that we've seen elsewhere in the country and also work closely with public health officials, including the Rhode Island uh, Department of Health. So uh, I hope that provides some detail that parents uh, could feel like they're informed and understand our thought process. Thank you, President Gattel. This next question is for Vice President Amir. What does DPS do to ensure that we are following the campus visitor policy and guests are not staying overnight when they visit residential students? Great question. Uh, again, layer approach to everything. In COVID, frankly, and as we've become nimble and innovative, we've taken a lot of the practices that are taught in the classrooms uh, in the way that we operate. And uh, so we do a few things to uh, enforce the visitor policy. One, every single person that comes uh, through entry control has to stop and have a conversation with the officer there, show their health checker, even if they are not a student or faculty or staff member, for example, they might be doing contract work that day on campus. Um, and then if they, uh, and then the officer asks why they're on campus and what they're doing. And then in addition to um, the finding visitors who probably shouldn't be here sometimes in the evening, we have DPS doing rounds and then our residential life does rounds uh, each night also. Uh, I mean, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights. And then frankly, we have a rave system that uh, we set up a while ago for emergencies, but uh, students can also let us know right away if something's going on that is upsetting them or uh, they're not comfortable with. Of course, we don't rush to judgment. We investigate and if people do have uh, friends that shouldn't be here, we ask them, uh, we escort them to leave campus. So those uh, three things working in tandem uh, really help. And then um, the health checker app is used all over campus in all of the eating facilities, at the gym, in many classrooms, and uh, et cetera. So that helps us uh, keep, keep that. And frankly, we really haven't had a large issue with visitors as some campuses have. Thank you, Vice President Amir. This next question is for um, Provost Silmacy. What is the spring semester going to look like in terms of course selection and class times? Thanks, Vice President Cloutier. Uh, it will be essentially uh, what we would have anticipated last uh, spring when we put it together. Um, and what it is now is uh, our uh, delivery of the classes will remain as they were in the fall. Again, we have to anticipate uh, that this uh, virus will not be going away during any time at the immediate future. So we are having the classes with 20 minutes apart, utilizing extra space on the campus for uh, classrooms to be utilized. 
making sure masking and six foot distancing, all of that will continue with normal course selection as we normally would do and, and your sons and daughters will be registering soon. Um, uh, I did want to answer uh, while I have uh, everyone is uh, two questions that came up is to repeat some of the dates. Um, com commencement for the class of 21 is scheduled for Saturday, May the 22nd. Saturday, May the 22nd, and I, uh, this is posted online on the Bryant website and in our uh, academic calendar on the Bryant University uh, website as well. Saturday, May 22nd, and classes begin February 1st through the 5th, that's remote. The move-in is Saturday, February 6th, 7th, and 8th, and that's a Saturday, Sunday, and a Monday, and the intention of that is, again, safety to ensure we do the testing. That will be a lot cooler on February 6th, 7th, and 8th, and then it was when we were out waving to everybody, giving away high fives when they were coming on the campus during the testing. But I think that uh, for this case, just so you know, the three days is to make sure we do the same item uh, and commitment to safety and getting tests done as they come back to campus and make sure everyone is in a, a very methodical process to returning to campus. Again, when someone says, Michelle, when you're saying the spring semester, it'll be basically like the fall. I mean, we're going to have to uh, maintain those same masking, six foot distancing, uh, faculty wearing masks, and also the uh, arrows, the directions, uh, how people are proceeding through the hallways. Uh, that's something uh, I can't begin to tell you how it's amazing how quiet it is. Um, we have full classes going on, everything's going, but when you go through, the students aren't congregating inside of the roto. They're following arrows, which take you around. I mean, some of it uh, is is burdensome. I mean, it's different, and they're rising to the occasion. I mean, mine, as most of you know, President Gattel is literally the next office down, and I have to walk around to go all the way around to get in, and it helps. And and quite frankly, uh, you know, it's helping me get in my steps. So it's all working out. But uh, we anticipate a very great spring semester, one that uh, again we're preparing for it to remain as is. If something changes, we would be able to adjust, as you know, in the Bryant fashion. We'd adjust the calendar. We'd adjust the um, uh, how we're delivering the uh, information. But as of now, we have to proceed as if things will not change from what it is now. Thank you, Provost Lamacy. Another question that came in is someone is asking where Tupper is. I will share with you that <laughs> Tupper is here. Um, and for those of you who remember going through the application process with your sons and daughters, it's very different this year. So Tupper goes on our virtual high school visits and makes some cameo and guest appearances uh, to get our new incoming students all excited. So he is here, he is still on campus, um, and who knows, he might make an appearance uh, one of these days down the road. I'm convinced that was Tupper himself hitting that, asking that question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, President Cattell, uh, this next question is for you. It's a Hard three to follow that question. I'll tell you. Sorry. <laughs> so, this um, is a three-part question um, are surrounding um, athletics. So, first, who makes the decision on whether and when Bryant Athletics will move from Phase 2 to Phase 3? What are the considerations for that decision? And uh, what are the plans for the football season? Okay, well, you know, I can't avoid this, but uh, it's not Tupper that makes a decision about uh, <laughs> whether to continue athletics. But no, this is a very serious uh, question. And uh, I uh, work very closely with the athletic director uh, of uh, Bryant University, uh, uh, Bill Smith, uh, and we review the data that I shared with uh, everybody on this webinar earlier. And see where we are with regards to the uh, uh, COVID-19 and our positivity test rates. And really we, pub we balance the uh, public uh, uh, safety and health for the whole campus, uh, uh, the safety and health of our uh, student athletes. Uh, uh, and also we balance that with, uh, you know, the need for uh, not only our student athletes, but uh, our whole campus to, uh, to be healthy and fit and to have some release of that uh, that energy, and uh, uh, you know, during these very uh, anxious and challenging times. Uh, so what we're doing is, uh, you know, Bill and I uh, meet on a regular basis. Uh, we're doing a phased-in approach to uh, to uh, competitive athletics and also to clubs and recreational activities on campus, uh, where that involves, uh, yes, in some activities, uh, continued masking. 
it involves uh, 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 spacing uh, uh, where that's uh, possible. And we started with, uh, you know, basic conditioning where there's a lot of opportunity for spacing and masking and then uh, into some skills development and uh, we're going to be moving into uh, towards phase three, which will have some competition, but with the appropriate uh, masking. Again, uh, we know we're going to be in uh, this uh, you know, kind of COVID careful phase uh, for quite a while. And we want to make sure that we don't uh, uh, limit everything, uh, but we try to do this in a uh, measured way and a data informed way to allow for some athletics uh, to begin. So it's really a lot of consultation. You know, I talked about meeting with Glenn and Inga and our tabletop exercises, Inga sending data at five, six in the morning. And then I meet on a regular basis with the athletic director uh, to really review the data and think about the needs of the, uh, the student athletes and the campus as a whole. Thank you, President Cattell. This is another question for you, Vice President Amir. So as it's starting to get cold outside, or at least next week's forecast, this feels a little chilly, um, what changes are going to be made to the tent in Salmo? Great question. And uh, before I answer that, I just want to let people know that I'm just about to send out an email to all students saying that uh, Grab and Go has finally come to Salmo for every meal uh, uh, in the week. And students can come in, get a container, take with the food that they want and go uh, eat it wherever they want or back in their room or if they're in, on a busy day uh, schedule, they can grab a healthy meal and go to the next appointment that they have. So I just wanted everyone to know that we're really pleased. Um, wanna especially thank the provost and the president for their support in getting this to happen. Um, so we are looking at heating the tent and at taking down the walls more and getting on a regular schedule as it gets colder. Uh, and then I just want to reiterate that the health and nutrition of our students are very important to us and important in student affairs. So we're going to continue to monitor that and uh, work with Sodexo to make improvements in our dining options. Thank you, Vice President Amir. This next one is for you again. Um, this has to do about the Wi-Fi connectivity in the residence halls. Are you able to address this? First, I just want to say that my two children would think it was hysterical that I was answering <laughs> a tech question since I ask them mostly, but I'm very happy to answer it. Uh, we have had some connectivity issues in some of the residence halls and we did a thorough investigation and turns out it's some of the cement walls. So we've placed an order for what are called access booster point plugs. And if your student's having an issue with connectivity, doesn't have to have concrete in their room, um, they should just call the IT help desk and they will come in and install one of those boosters into the bedroom so that your student can have better connectivity. Thank you, Vice President Mir. Max and Molly would be proud. Thank you. <laughs> President Gattel, this is a very uh, active group here. The next question is for you surrounding um, the plans for club and intramural sports for this fall, um, yes, particularly what are the plans? <laughs> no, I appreciate the, uh, the interest in the activity because uh, as I said before, it's important for students, uh, for all of us to have some sort of physical outlet and to be able to reduce the stress. So we are giving attention to this. And as I try to indicate uh, previously, Michelle, is uh, we're following a similar methodology, club sports and recreation as with uh, competitive athletics on campus, uh, uh, because the same principles, public health uh, principles apply uh, to those different populations, even though of course the student athletes are kind of more intense in their activities and potential for contact and, uh, and, and contagion. Uh, but we're phasing in the approach. Uh, I think uh, the plans I heard, I want to, I think we have beach volleyball uh, planned uh, for intramurals. And I actually just got a, an update. So if you just bear with me, uh, it's this semester, we will have um, uh, scheduled sports, uh, uh, sand volleyball, uh, and uh, softball uh, for this semester. So we could, uh, and you could see those sports allow for some 
more uh, spacing. And even in that instance, uh, the softball teams and the uh, the sand volleyball. I guess we don't have beaches in the western part of uh, Rhode Island, but uh, they will be masked. So, uh, and I actually, when I go past the uh, uh, the track and other places, the the fields. Uh, a lot of our students, when they are recreating, are, are fully masked, and that's great. And it goes back to where we all started. Your sons and daughters are doing a great job, and they're masking, and they're figuring out how to do it. So, you know, hats off to them, and we're going to do that in club sports, too. Thank you, President Cattell. Vice President Mira, this next question is for you. What is the spring semester going to look like uh, in terms of move-in and access to on-campus testing? And do students need to bring their belongings home over the um, Thanksgiving the, between the semesters? Great questions. Um, Move-in will be over a three-day period, as the provost um, uh, referenced when talking about the calendar. Uh, you will make an appointment. Uh, you'll have uh, some time on campus. Your student can bring two uh, people with them um, to help them uh, get adjusted and, you know, carry all that water from Costco and all the other great things. Um, at this time, we're not asking students to take all of their belongings home with them. The virus is ever changing, but right now things are going very well at Bryant, as we've been saying. So uh, we would let you know, though, if that were to change. Uh, everyone will be tested again. Um, and everyone will uh, have time, uh, will be given food for their room, and then as soon as they get their result, they can come on out and enjoy the Bryant campus. As many of you know from your students, we have three visits we make every day now with, uh, the, uh, with the COVID test files, so students will get their results more quickly. We learned a lot from our first couple of weeks of testing. Like I said, nimbleness, innovation, we're always talking and, and making improvements. So that's how that will go. I don't know where, I think we'll, we'll be using the inside testing facility and having people drive up there. And we will let you know it and map that out for you as we decide how we're gonna operate that. Thank you, Vice President Amir. Next question, again, for you, President Cattell, you're pretty popular today. Good. How many positive cases do we have? Okay, you know, I saw that come in on the Q&A and uh, a very good follower of the data noted that uh, the uh, on the second tab that I shared, there were actually uh, 38 positive cases. There were the 13 active and the 25 that were uh, not active, not current anymore. And the 28 that I refer to as our own testing, the uh, Broad testing, there's 28 positives uh, that, that we've had out of uh, 20, over at 28,000 tests. The other 10 were done uh, off campus, off our testing. So they could have been uh, a commuter student. They could have been somebody who was off campus. They were in our testing. Uh, we report the fully validated uh, bro testing that we contract for. And we've had 28,000 tests taken, 28. Uh, uh, positives, uh, and then there's still just 13, there are just 13 uh, current uh, cases. So that's the actual number, and we do keep that detailed data, and that's why it looked a little different um, uh, uh, to some, but there have been just 28 out of over 28,000 with our comprehensive uh, broad testing, and as I indicated, those other 10 are from off-campus uh, locations, but they're part of what we uh, have reported to the Rhode Island Department of Health. And that's why I decided to share that uh, with you. Uh, we have made this very significant investment with Broad, uh, as I mentioned before, over $3 million to get those test results uh, in a timely fashion and with high accuracy. And, uh, you know, uh, I, you know uh, I think that's one of the best investments we've made on this campus because it's helped us stay open. Uh, people should know that if uh, there is a positive test, that person gets contacted uh, directly uh, uh, right away. It is a, uh, uh, it is a phone call uh, and the information uh, is garnered from that individual about who they've been in contact with recently. So there can be uh, the necessary uh, and appropriate quarantining of those people who are in contact with those, those individuals who have tested positive. 
uh, who are at close proximity for extended periods of time for over 20 minutes and uh, unmasked. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, on that point, it's been very helpful. And we've been asking students, your sons and daughters, to try to keep a log about who they're in contact with in case uh, in the very unfortunate uh, circumstance where they do get, uh, you know, contract the virus, we're able to, to uh, contact trace and identify those individuals that have been in contact with them. Uh, back to the dashboard, you know, we're, we're continuing to think about ways to make this data available. We do use seven day moving averages uh, because, uh, you know, over a seven day period, we test the full population and can let you know the population incidence, uh, the positivity rates across the full population. On any given day, day to day, it's not a, an accurate uh, population sample. So that's why we don't give the individual day to day results because that doesn't uh, reflect the true population. But if an, a, a daily uh, result really uh, was a very high increase in COVID cases, we would act accordingly. So Michelle, that's probably more detail than anybody wanted, but uh, you know, we wanna make sure, you know, we wanna make sure the data uh, is available and questions get answered. So we're always available uh, for these types of questions. Thank you. Um, this next question is for all of our panelists, starting with you, President Cattell. Given the low number of positive cases, is there any chance the current restrictions could be lessened? You know, uh, I think uh, Provost Somacy, you know, highlighted this is uh, there's a lot of uncertainty uh, with this COVID virus. And there's some places, some nations, uh, I think, uh, Glenn, you cited uh, France and Spain's uh, where you know countries uh, and in some states in this country have let up their guards and said, okay, go back and let's return more towards uh, what you did uh, in the past. And uh, this virus uh, uh, is still with us and we have to manage it appropriately. So we're gonna continue to practice what we've been talking about. And uh, you know, there's, not, there's like no other team that would want more than to be able to return to normalcy than the people you're looking at here. But we're also being very realistic. And first and foremost in our minds is the health and safety uh, of your students and to maintain the high quality academic and student life experience that we're committed to on this campus. So, you know, we don't really see things changing even if the, the numbers look pretty good now, Michelle, they look very good now. But we know, you know, tomorrow or the next day or in two weeks, or right before you know uh, we open in the spring, we could see a, a change, and we don't want to be doing things that will contribute to uh, to undermining all the progress we made on this campus to date. Vice President Amir or Provost Lamacy, did you have anything you'd like to add? Um, I just wanted to say uh, that these are very hard decisions for us to make, um, and we don't. Um, make any of them lightly. Every time we look at the data and at the, what the Rhode Island Department of Health is saying and the CDC and, and try to make the best decisions we can for the entire community. And uh, I think things are going really well and, and when you've got a good streak, you go with that. And so um, right now, I think that's, that's where we're at. We do talk all the time uh, and, and uh, make changes sometimes and reconsider things and et cetera, et cetera. So um, I just want you to know that we're taking the health and safety of your students and all the people that are at Bryant really seriously. And uh, we're very proud of the students and of, of the work that we're all doing. And I think things are going really well. And um, as my grandfather would say, when things are going well, go with it. So that's where we are with it right now. Provost Macy, did you have anything you'd like to add? I just agree with Grandpa Amir uh, completely. I think uh, we're, we're uh, you know, spot on with what Inga and the president are saying. We've just got to continue what we're doing. I, uh, I can't help but uh, wish it were different. I think as the president said, we all wish it were different, but it's not right now. Um, but I do think talking to other universities, um, uh, in the area and around the region and around the country. I mean, we're doing something that's right in terms of making sure we're getting your children in seat experience, having a college life experience from Inga's team, 
and having an overall university experience during a period that's unprecedented in, in, in really the world history, but definitively in American history for the last century. So um, if you pull ourselves out of this at some point, we ought to look back on this and say, oh my gosh, there was a lot of sacrifice, a lot of change shifting priorities, but we have to make that in order to make this work. And um, you know, I think we wanna stay on this course we're on right now until something really otherwise changes. But uh, gosh, I think uh, when I talk to the other folks at the Providence College uh, provost who's a friend and the president speaks to the president at, at uh, PC pretty frequently and Inga talks to the VPSA, uh, we just gotta stay on it and keep them going and, and tell your uh, daughters and sons, at this point, the benchmark is to November 24th. After that, we can worry about uh, the spring, but if they can just pull this off to that point, I think that will be a, something we'll look back fondly upon. Thank you, Provost Macy, And thank all of you for joining us this afternoon. I hope you found the conversation helpful and informative. And even though things are looking a little bit different this year, we are trying to get through this together and make it a meaningful learning experience. President Cattell, is there anything that you would like to add in closing? No, you know, I appreciate the questions and uh, the parents' uh, involvement uh, in this session. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's critical that we stay in communication with parents and we look forward to doing that. Uh, if there's any changes, is there any, if there's any developments, we're going to uh, put a priority on communications and transparency. Well, thank you all for being here. Uh, we're all in this together and we will certainly be uh, Brian Strong all the way. Have a great rest of your week and take care.